Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. Every month, members get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection, and access to daily news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, as well as guided meditation programs. Between a full-time job in IT and a full-time job in podcasting, it gets harder and harder to sit down and read the books I'm interested in. This is where Audible comes in. I can listen on my daily commute, relaxing, or while out running errands and still get in the books I've been wanting to get into. You can download titles and listen offline anytime, anywhere. The app is free and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. Now you can try Audible risk-free with a special 30-day free trial by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. That's audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. Don't let your busy life get in the way of that great book you've been wanting to read. Go get your free trial of Audible today. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. This is Jeffrey, and we've talked about many times before that I experience problems and struggles with my mental health. And really, without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy does work. It's helped for me. But but what is is, is therapy exactly? It's it's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships at work or you're not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's really time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles. And, and it's time to start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. So join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And there's a special offer to Nerdery and Murdery listeners. You can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash nerdery and murdery. That's betterhelp.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. And shepherds, we shall be for thee, my Lord, for thee. Powers have descended forth from thy hand, that our feet may swiftly carry out thy command. So we shall flow a river forth to thee, and teeming with souls shall it ever be. In nomine patris, e fili, e spiritus sancti. <laughs> I have no fucking clue what you're talking about. <laughs> Welcome to episode 161 of Nerdery Murdery. Big 161. I'm Zig with your Nerdery. And I'm Jeffrey with your Murdery. Welcome to another week of the highs and lows and the ups and downs, the good and the bad and the nerd and the murd. Ready to start another exciting week. Um, do be sure to tune in next week and the week after as we will have our uh, we will have special guests. Um Mike Michael Shanks from Nerdery uh, from, from Nerdery Murdery. Huh? Michael <laughs> Shanks from Two Geeks and a Microphone, and his wife Brenda will be joining us for an extra special couple of music episodes. So that'll be really good. Ah, uh, but so with that though, I will let you take over on the nerdy side of the house. Excellent. Today we're going to talk about three more hardcore action flicks. Okay. All the right. First At one... least that gives me a clue. Yes, the first one is the Boondock Saints. Okay. That's, that's the I'm prayer they say before they... Never before seen they it, get, but I'm familiar with it. Uh, that's the prayer they say before they gack somebody. Gotcha. <laughs> the Boondock Saints is a 1999 American vigilante action thriller film written and directed by Troy Duffy in his feature directorial debut, starring Willem Dafoe, Sean Patrick Flannery, Norman Reedus, David Della Roca, and Billy Connolly. 
Sean the Patrick film- Flannery. That's always that's the guy I'm always trying to remember. I I I only remember him as the guy who killed himself in Goodwill Hunting. <laughs> what? Isn't he the one who, who who committed suicide in Goodwill Hunting? Not Goodwill Hunting. Yes. No, uh, Dead Poet Society. No. Is no, 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 no. No, that's Flannery? somebody else. Sean Patrick Flannery was the young Indiana Jones. Uh, in powder. Who's the one who committed suicide in uh, uh Sean Dead uh, Poet Society? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm always trying to remember his he name. Was, he was in Bones. Eh, no, well. Yeah, carry on. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the film follows Irish fraternal twin brothers, Connor and Murphy McManus, uh, who become vigilantes after killing two members of the Russian mafia in self defense. After both experience an epiphany, the twins, together with their best friend, funny man Rocco, set out on a mission to rid Boston of the criminal underworld in the name of God, all while being pursued by FBI special agent Paul Smecker. Um, Duffy had never written a screenplay before, uh, said he was inspired by personal experiences while living with his brother Taylor in L.A. Initially regarded as one of the hottest scripts in Hollywood, the film had a trouble production. Miramax Films dropped the project in 97 before Franchise Picture acquired the rights the following year. Principal photography began in Boston and Toronto on August 10th, 1998 and concluded on September 26th. Uh, the theatrical release of the Boondock Saints was significantly affected by the Columbine High School Massacre, mm-hmm. which had taken place just two weeks before screen testing or uh, test screenings. Uh, amidst concerns of the film would inspire copycat crimes, it was given at a limited release in only five theaters across the U.S. on January 21st, 2000. Consequently, the film was a box office failure and received negative reviews from critics, while criticism aimed at its perceived glorification of vigilante justice and violence. Despite this, the Boondock Saints became a cult classic through word of mouth and its home video release, ultimately grossing $50 million in sales. A successful 2006 theatrical re-release led to a sequel, The Boondock Saints 2 All Saints Day, with Flannery, Redis, Connery, and Rocco reprising their roles, and uh, Defoe making an uncredited cameo appearance. Uh, a documentary about the making of the film was also uh, released. The third film is currently in development with Duffy, Flannery, and Reedus expected to return. So Duffy was a bartender when he got the idea for the first vigilante flick. During those days, he was getting pretty sick of the world. Enraged by the random acts of violence he saw in the news and the street-level horrors he witnessed in his own neighborhood. Duffy started writing the Boondock Sites. Interesting, interestingly, aside from the two Boondock films, Duffy hadn't directed anything else. He did co-write the script for the poorly received Polly Shore movie Guest House and was the subject of a Rise and Fall documentary overnight. Um, basically, it's about these two uh, Irish-American fraternal twin brothers uh, who run afoul. They've, they've got a friend named Rocco uh, who's actually in the Italian mob, but loosely. He's like a bad man. Um, they're celebrating St. Patrick's Day at this little local Irish bar. And the Russian mob comes in to close it down to basically take it over because the guy that runs it hasn't paid his uh, protection money. So they beat the hell out of him and end up killing him. They end up getting taken in by the police, but the police are like, hey, you guys, this is clearly self-defense. You guys didn't do this. And while they're in with the police, um, they wake up. And realize that what they should be doing is taking out bad guys. So they go back to where the altercation happened, steal some money and guns, and start on this process. And it's 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 amazing and beautiful and funny, and it's it's a ballet of violence. Mm-hmm. Um, and Paul Smecker ends up helping them toward the end. It's a uh, it's just beautiful and and wonderful and uh, and crazy and. It is, it is a ballet of violence. I I can't recommend it enough. I've seen it several times. I've heard lots of people say this is a really good movie. I, I, like I said, I I've never watched it. I think it's one I would probably enjoy. Um, and I need I need to sit down and watch it sometime. Yeah, this is this is a great one. I I can't believe you hadn't seen it. Mm-mm. Um, it's it's lovely. It's I put it up there with uh, Four Brothers. Mm-hmm. It's of that same vein. Um, these two basically Robin Hood characters, um, 
and they come back in the second movie like 10 years later. Um, Norman Reedus and Sean Pla Patrick Flannery are incredible in this as the two brothers because they're, yeah, they're kind of tough, but they're they're unassuming. They work in a meat packing plant, you know. They're they're just they work they're working stiffs. They like to go out and have a good time after work, but mostly they want to go to work and be left alone. And when this falls in their lap, it's it's a uh, it's seen as a uh, like like fate. Uh, has been intertwined with them. And you find out later that uh, one of the characters that's sent to kill them uh, is actually plays very heavily in that whole fate narrative. Um, it's, yeah, it's amazing. The next film is Striking Distance. It is a 1993 American action thriller film starring Bruce Willis as a Pittsburgh police homicide detective, Tom Hardy. The film co-stars Sarah Jessica Parker, Dennis Farina, and Tom Sizemore. It was directed by Rowdy Harrington and written by Harrington and Marty Kaplan. The film was shot on location throughout Pittsburgh. Its early title was Three Rivers. Uh, Pittsburgh ho homicide detective Tom Hardy turns, turns in his partner and cousin Jimmy DeTillo for using excessive force, which in turn causes him to become alienated by the majority of his fellow officers. Thomas and his father, Vincent, are en route to the policeman's ball when a call comes, uh, indicating that a serial killer, the Polish Hill Strangler, who Tommy believes is a police officer, has been spotted driving in downtown Pittsburgh. As Tom and Vince pursue the killer's car, the vehicles collide and both roll down an embankment. When Tom regains consciousness, he learns his father has been shot dead and the killer has escaped. Police arrest a criminal named Douglas Kesser as the Strangler, and Jimmy later jumps off the 31st Street Bridge and his body is never found. Um, that's kind of the opening of, of this film. Um, it was cited as one of the many trouble projects during the, that time. Uh, Sony Pictures was run by Joe Peters and Peter Gruber, and it took a huge amount of resources to merely break even. Uh, but filming only took 13 weeks in the summer of 1992 in Pittsburgh. The working title was Three Rivers, and it was scheduled for release on May 21st, 1993. But after the original cut performed poorly with test audiences, extensive research reshoots were done in Los Angeles with story changes and removal of some plot points. Because of this, the release date was pushed from May to September. And according to articles and reports at the time, test audiences were unimpressed with the initial cut of the film. Largely, allegedly, because they found parts of it confusing. Those parts were added into director Roger Harrington and Marty Kaplan's original script by star Bruce Willis. One such claim the original cut was like Hudson Hawk would up the last. Um, one of the veteran production members said that Willis called the shots like he did on Hudson Hawk and like he used to do on Moonlighting. He had scenes rewritten. He did what he wanted to do, and we were working. It was like we were working with Orson Welles. Uh, when news about reshoots was reported, Columbia's then current chairman, Mark Canton, said in an interview that he couldn't be more enthusiastic about the film, predicting it would be a beyond sizable hit. But in order to do so, the movie had to make $30 million plus profit at the box office. Canton was known for being heavily involved in several other films in earlier years and had very, uh, very troubled productions and received negative reception from audiences during test screenings. Those included Wes Craven's sci-fi horror film uh, Deadly Friend and one of Willis's earlier box office flops, The Bonfire of the Vanities, and John McKiernan's last action hero. Um, in Striking Distance's case, for example, all the love intimate scenes between Hardy and Joe were reshot to make them sexier. Several dialogue scenes, such as the scene in the bar between Willis and Sizemore, were also cut to make the film's pace quicker. Um, interviews regarding the problems with the film, according to the cast and crew, Willis treated Harrington very poorly during both initial filming and reshoots. The theatrical trailer shows a lot of deleted, extended, and alternative scenes, uh, probably ones that were cut or changed from the original cut. Um, uh, there are also many promotional stills that show several other deleted scenes, such as Tom and Joe pulling a man out of the water while a group of people watch them, and a deleted shot from the ending showing Tom kneeling over Nick's body. Um, I would say there are some trouble. Uh, there's some trouble with this movie. Have you seen Striking Distance? No, and I'm surprised at being a uh, Bruce Willis flick that I haven't seen. It. I like Bruce yeah. Willis. Yeah. Oh my god, it was on. It was on cable uh, all the time um, hmm. back in the late '90s, early 2000s. 
I love this film, not for Bruce Willis, but for, for everybody else in it. Well, Dennis Farina, uh, for sure. Oh, my God. Dennis Farina is incredible in this. And he's not he's not really playing a bad guy. He's also not really playing a good guy either. Um, Robert Pastorelli um, uh, of Murphy Brown fame is mm -hmm. also in it. Um, he is incredible. Uh, you, you think he's gone in the first few minutes, but then he comes back. Uh, Tom, Tom Sizemore is great in this. Um, uh, Brian James is also in this uh, as a as an underling to um, Chief Dottillo. Oh my God! Everybody in this is 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 beyond uh, compare, with the exception of Bruce Willis. Um, but the character itself is very interesting. He's a He's this really good detective who no one believes, and um, he's being pursued uh, basically by the uh, uh, internal affairs mm -hmm. uh, for the state. Um, and you come to find out later on that his new partner, who has been assigned to him, is a detective with the state, um, uh, Joe Crispin. Sarah Jessica Parker... A lot of her scenes fall a little flat, and I think that's because they were reshot. Because there's some scenes where she's just incredible, so I'm thinking maybe some of the reshoots were kind of the problem. Um, because she does look a little different in them, like her hair is a little shorter or not quite as blonde as it was in a scene prior. I think that has a lot to do with those reshoots. Mm -hmm. um, I love this movie. Uh, I've seen it several times. I just watched it again recently. While I was putting these notes together, I was like, oh, I need to do three more hardcore action flicks. And I was like, I need to do Striking Distance. I kind of agree that the title should be Three Rivers because it all concerns the rivers. He's a, he's a, he's a, a detective in the opening. He gets busted down to River Patrol. And the serial killer comes back and starts dumping bodies into the river so he will find them. Um, and they're all like, women he dated previously so when they start investigating these murders they think it might be him you know even though everybody told him he was wrong when he said it was a police officer he's like the only way this guy's been able to get with it uh, get away with this is because he knows our policies and procedures this guy's a cop or is very close to a cop um so they start investigating him even though he's the one that originally was like, this is a cop. Um, and you find out there's a cover up involved. Um, it's just, it's brilliant. It's, it, it's wonderful. Bruce Willis is not great. Um, he is passable, but he doesn't have to be great. Everybody else in this is so good. It doesn't matter. Um, and Pittsburgh is beautiful. Uh, I had no idea, uh, especially from the standpoint of the Three Rivers, uh, which is where most of this takes place. Just lovely. Um, I would recommend it highly. Uh, I put some scenes in in our YouTube playlist. You guys can get out there and see them. Um, again, keep in mind, Bruce Willis is basically just playing Bruce Willis. But that's okay, because this character is kind of that person, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, it probably would have been a better film if they'd have gotten somebody else, um, you know, a Kurt Russell or somebody else. Um, but it is, it's, it's pretty hardcore and action oriented and, you know, it's on the water. Uh, there's a really great shootout scene, a couple of really nice car chases and boat chases. Um, and, uh, you know, like a, a giant fist fight between two cop families at the policeman's ball because Bruce Willis's family, his mom's side of the family is Dottillo. But his dad's side, the Hardys, are also a cop family. Um, so it's it's just bizarre. And, and they basically get into a giant fist fight. Um at the policeman's for me, ball. For me, outside of like Die Hard, probably my favorite Bruce Willis movie, or actually a couple of movies, is Red and Red Two. I freaking um, love those two movies. 
If you like red and red too, you'll like this one. Yeah. Um, again, again, keep it in mind. Bruce Willis could be better, um, but everybody else more than makes up for it. The next film is Dark Blue. It is a 2002 American neo-noir crime thriller film directed by Ron Shelton and written by David Ayer. Based on a story written for film by crime novelist James Elroy and takes place during the days leading up to the Rodney King trial verdict. The film stars Kurt Russell with Ving Rhames and Brendan Gleeson in supporting roles. In September 2000, it was announced uh, Intermedia had acquired James Elroy's The Plague Season for development. In February 2001, Kurt Russell had signed on to star in the film, which would be directed by Ron Shelton from a rewrite David Ayer performed of the initial Elroy Penn script. Elroy had written the script back in 1993, specifically with Russell in mind for the lead. The following month, Bing Rains was cast opposite Russell. Uh, Los Angeles 1992, the film opens in media rest to LAPD Sergeant Eldon Perry, who is pacing in a motel room with a shotgun in, and a pistol. And then it shoots to five days earlier. Four people are killed and one wounded when two men, Daryl Orchard and Gary Sidwell, rob a convenience store in order to gain access to the office safe. Meanwhile, Perry defends his partner, Detective Bobby Kehoe, before an internal hearing concerning Kehoe's use of deadly force in a previous case. Kehoe is later exonerated. Perry and Kehoe later celebrate Perry's impending promotion with their superior and Kehoe's uncle, Jack Van Meter. Van Meter, a corrupt cop, uh, who often engages his subordinates to fabricate evidence, visits Orchard and Sidwell's house later that night and takes the money stolen from the safe, admonishing them for behaving recklessly during the robbery. Van Meter assigns Perry and Keogh to investigate the robbery, providing a false alibi for Orchard and Sidwell and telling them to pin the crime on someone else. Meanwhile, Assistant Chief Arthur Holland finds Perry's testimony at Keogh's hearing suspicious. Doubting that Keogh killed the suspect and he, as he was charged, his assistant, Beth Williamson, pulls files on the two men and sees the man she previously had anonymous casual sex with. It's Keogh. Uh, it stars Kurt Russell, Scott Speedman uh, as Detective Bobby Keogh. Michael, uh, Michael Michelle as Sergeant Beth Williams. Brendan Gleeson as Commander Jack Van Meter. Ving Rains as Assistant Chief Arthur Holland. Master P as Maniac. Corrupt is Daryl Orchard, and Dash Myhock is uh, Gary Sidwell. Jonathan Banks is Deputy Chief Jimmy Barcombe. Uh, Eloy Casadas is SWAT Commander Rico. Graham Beckel is Detective Peltz. William Ute is Detective Sapien. Lolita Davidovich is Sally Perry. Chapman Wally is Eldon Perry III. Marnie Hinkle is Assistant District Attorney Dina Schultz. Um, just the cast is actually outstanding. The almost the end of the film, uh, Kurt Russell's character, uh, Perry, is giving an interview uh, about all the crazy stuff that's been going on with this cover up and everything, and is about to start to turn himself in. And everybody looks up, and the city is on fire. So, all the cops start getting their phones start going off, and they start getting you know, radio calls. and. So they were all up against each other for several weeks. And when the riot happens, they basically just run straight to the fires. And mm -hmm. that's how this film ends. It's like, God damn. Um, nobody. And I mean, nobody in this movie, with the exception of Perry's son, Eldon Perry III, played by Chapman Way is a good guy mm -hmm. everybody everybody is 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 a shade of gray um, sounds like uh 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 the departed oh my god yeah yeah um the departed kind of cribbed some stuff off of this i think this movie didn't do really well um and i, did, and I, I never heard of it i i do not know why because it is this is hard War. I mean, some close-up gunshots, um, uh, strippers, uh, mobsters, uh, drug runners. Um, the the people you think are the nice people that got robbed. Uh, no, no, they're running drugs for this cartel. Uh, 
<laughs> their little store is a is a front. Uh, that's why there was so damn much money in the safe. Um, nobody is a good guy. Brendan Gleeson and Ving Rhames are probably the worst. Ving Rhames is just trying to climb the ladder, and he's stepping on everybody he can to get there. And Brendan Gleeson is a dirty, dirty, dirty cop. I mean, just wild how nuts this film is. Um, and again, it played on cable a lot, just like Striking Distance. Um, just like the Boondock Saints. Um, these are three that that kind of, well, maybe not, not necessarily the Boondock Saints because yeah, I was going to say that got that's got pretty wide viewership. Yeah, yeah but if you if you view all three of these films together, you, you you'll get that neo noir feel to it. Again, the only problem I have with these three films is Bruce Willis's acting. I don't want to say it's bad, but it is subpar. Other than that, all three of these films are. Hard burners, um, especially if you like a really decent action film. Um, these three films are for you. Ben, that's about it for three more hardcore action flicks. Awesome. Well, thanks for that. And You're everybody welcome. get out there, give them a watch. Uh, let us know what you think about them. Uh, like I said, I, I, I definitely need to watch Boondock Saints, Saints for yeah. sure. And uh maybe i'll get striking distance in it, it, as well especially if you said if 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 i liked red i'd like this one because i oh, i yeah. loved red and red too i love yeah. those yeah like i said the only problem is bruce willis could have been better in this film um this is my same that's my same critique of cop out bruce willis could have been better in cop out too mm -hmm. um but it doesn't take away from it doesn't take that much away from the film in both cases because the rest of the cast is outstanding cool cool deal all right well then with that i'll take over on the murdery side of the house murder uh for today i got my information off medium the los angeles times abc 10 news san diego and find law and this is the story of the murder of ann jenkins ann jenkins this is kind of a wild one. Um, so Ann Jenkins, uh, she was 30 years old. Uh, she she had, uh, was selecting her lotto numbers at the kitchen table in their family's home. Um, she, you know, she kind of appeared slightly older than her age. Um, her, her husband, 35-year-old Gary, was watching over her. She was picking the numbers. Um, and before leaving for school, their two older kids, two each from prior marriages, made their lotto picks. Uh, they did have a youngest uh, a child who was less than a year old, who was too young to participate in that. Uh, but on his drive to work from their home in San Diego, uh, in, in, in the San Diego suburb of San Marcos, uh, Gary stopped at 7-Eleven and purchased five tickets. And Ann's sister watched the kids that night while the parents attended a community meeting. Uh, she watched the winning numbers on the TV and she scribbled the, the, the winning numbers down on a napkin. And when Gary and Ann came home, they couldn't believe it. Ann had actually picked five of the six winning numbers and the correct oh, bonus nice. number. So Ann called the 7-Eleven just to be sure. And the owner, Margaret Martinez, confirmed they were the winners and would collect $720,000. Uh, three weeks later, Ann and Gary collected their check, which was almost 600000 after taxes. Uh, they went back to the 7-Eleven, took picture with the Martinez, who owned the, the 7-Eleven. Ann quit her job as a secretary at her father's construction company, and the couple decided to spend the first 100000 and invest the remainder. Uh, they did buy tickets for a family vacation at Disney World and talked of having another baby and planned to buy a home. because They were renting a home, I, I may have said previously. Um, on February 17th, 1988, Ann's sister phoned Gary. She'd picked the kids up from school when Ann didn't show up, and Ann wasn't answering the phone. So Gary then left work and drove home, and in the driveway, he saw their Chevy Suburban uh, sitting in the driveway, which was only half washed. There was a bucket filled with dirty water sitting nearby, and the hose was still, uh, was still on, and dried soap streaked the windows. So Gary opened the locked front door. He called out Ann's name and he he went around from room to room 
and he found their infant still asleep in his crib. And then Gary encountered Anne's body in a back hallway, half leaning against the bathroom door. Her throat had been slashed and she was cold and stiff. He called 911 immediately and all he could uh, yell into the phone was, oh my God, my wife's dead. Um, there was very little blood, which is interesting with her throat being slashed. Uh, police determined that Anne had been strangled and then stabbed. And detectives noted that noted that her hands were uninjured and her manicured fingernails were still intact, which means she didn't attack back whoever attacked her. Mm -hmm. Either she knew them or they came up behind her. Right. Uh, the forensics team that came out found no fingerprints, fibers, hairs, or a murder weapon. Uh, later, one of the people involved in the case said, quote, this was the perfect crime. There was nothing found at the crime scene to help the investigating detectives learn who did it. However, there was an obvious suspect. They thought the murderer might, would most likely be her disgruntled ex-husband. Oh. So Anne had married her high school sweetheart, David Scott Harrison, in 1976. They had two children, which I had mentioned previously from the previous marriage. Five years into the marriage, Anne filed her for divorce, uh, which triggered a multi-year battle over custody, visitation rights, child support, alimony, and jointly held property. After the divorce in 1986, Anne married Gary Jenkins, who was a construction foreman, and David Harrison began harassing the newlyweds. He forwarded all their mail to Hawaii, changed their phone number, and subscribed them to unwanted magazines. Uh, he was widely... <laughs> 1986. Yes. That's what you did in 1986. Yes. Un unwanted magazines. I'm sorry. Please continue. No worries. Uh, David Harrison was wider, widery with uh, receding hair and a flat, sneaky smile. And he had used his family's wealth to manipulate and extend the legal battle with Anne, hoping the cost would bankrupt her. Uh, Harrison then targeted Anne's parents when they began paying for her attorneys. And using the name of her dad, Harry Wankett, Harrison placed an ad in a swingers magazine soliciting gay sex. Huh. Uh, Harry Wankett would receive pornogra pornographic photos in the mail and over 300 telephone calls from interested men. And then Harrison sent newsletters entitled Incest Alert to the Wankett's friends and claimed that, uh, that Harry Wankett had molested Anne. Um, a few years after uh, Anna divorced uh, David Harrison, he was shot between the eyes during a gunfight at the home he shared with his brother in a rural section of Escondido, where farms raised uh, juniper, ficus, and magnolia trees. Uh, the remote ranch was owned by his mother and used by his brother to grow and deal marijuana. And the shooting occurred when six people tried to steal pot plants from the property. Uh, David Harrison was helicoptered to a hospital and he fully recovered, shot between the eyes, and he fully recovered. That's amazing. Huh. Um, in June That's some head trauma right there, buddy. No kidding. In June of 87, which was a year into Gary's marriage to Anne, uh, David Harrison planted a pipe bomb under a VW van belonging to Gary's ex-wife. Uh, the bomb exploded at 3 a.m. and no one was injured, but the car was destroyed and shrapnel tore through the windows of the of the home. Uh, Gary's children were sleeping inside. Dude. A few days later, uh, David Harrison called Gary and asked to meet. Gary refused, saying the discussion should be handled through lawyers, to which David Harrison angrily, angrily exclaimed, quote, you either meet me there in a half hour or the next bomb will be thrown through your children's window. Wow. Uh, Gary still declined, but he did call the police and they didn't seriously investigate the bombing. Uh, David Harrison owned several parcels. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yep. Police didn't want to investigate a bombing that nope. destroyed a VW van parked in front of someone's house. Not that they didn't investigate. Three o'clock in the morning. Not that they didn't investigate. They just didn't seriously investigate. They just kind of. Okay lightly went around it okay um david harrison opened uh owned several parcels in san diego county and when ann married him they became community property and a source of the disagreement um a judge did decide a case about the disputed properties in her favor um as if his life wasn't complicated enough david harrison was bisexual and engaged in relationships with both men and women Around the time he was shot, he began a relationship with a David Johnson. 
He told David Johnson that uh, he'd moved his more valuable belongings to a friend's house to hide them from his ex-wife and registered his businesses in his mother's name. Johnson said that Harrison mentioned killing Ann Jenkins hundreds of times. He said, quote, it was almost like a quest. He thought about it all the time. It was an obsession. He said that one night in bed, Harrison whispered, quote, I'd like to cut her throat so she can never talk, and I'd like to stand there and watch her bleed. Uh, Johnson and uh, Harrison's relationship did not last long. In 1987, David Harrison told another lover, Todd Newman, that, quote, it would have been easier to kill the bitch than to divorce her. Uh, when Newman ended their eight-month relationship, uh, David got revenge by setting fire to a boat stored in Newman's parents' driveway. Um, David Harrison did keep in touch with David Johnson, and shortly before the murder, he called to complain about his ex-wife. And David Johnson recalled that at first, quote, he didn't, he said he didn't know what he was going to do, but then he announced, I'm just going to have to kill her. Um, three days before Ann's murder, David Harrison lugged three duffel bags to a high school friend's house in Escondido. Uh, he told the friend, Bruce Freeberry that within a week, quote, the police will probably be in my home. When Bruce Freeberry asked why, David said, quote, watch TV. Something big is going to happen on Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, Bruce Freeberry was familiar with David Harrison's hatred for his ex-wife. He said, quote, at one point, he told me he had been talking to people about having Ann killed. He discussed one particular way of having Annie's car involved in an accident. When Gary and Ann won the lottery, uh, Freeberry said uh, uh, said that Harrison said, quote, didn't like it at all. He was or he, he said that Harrison didn't like it at all. He was concerned it would help Gary and Ann fight their custody battle. He worried that it gave uh, Ann the money to hire better lawyers. Uh, Freeberry's roommate overheard the conversation, and when he learned about Ann's murder, he contacted the police. Uh, authorities visited uh, Freeberry's home and opened the duffel bags, and inside were four galvanized pipe bombs, much used like the one to blow up the van of Gary's ex-wife. The bags also contained a 357 Magnum and ammunition and ammunition cartridges. That night, Harrison met Freeberry's girlfriend in a parking lot, and he demanded to know what Freeberry and his roommate had revealed to investigators. Uh, a few days later, police arrested David Harrison for felony bomb possession, uh, but given lack of evidence at the scene, prosecutors were not yet ready to indict him for Ann's murder, but he was too dangerous to release, so the judge denied bail. In jail, David Harrison offered a fellow prisoner a boat if he killed Freeberry before the bomb trial. The cellmate turned around and reported the offer to, to authorities. Hey! <laughs> say <laughs> this say guy you might need me... to know this <laughs> y'all need to know this hey by the way since i'm giving this information up can i get time off right exactly <laughs> uh after eight months behind bars david harrison pleaded guilty to bombing the vw van setting the boat afire and defrauding an insurance company by falsely reporting his mother's car stolen after he'd sold it for parts uh the judge then sentenced harrison to 20 years uh, Harrison's alibi for Ann's murder was that he had been hanging out by the pool all day at his condo in the Oceanside suburb of Del Mar. Inside that condo, police found knives, lockpicks, and some interesting books. Their titles included The Perfect Crime and How to Commit It, The Joy of Cold Revenge, The Revenge Book, The Anarchist Cookbook, and Murder, What Done It? So... <laughs> All those together, they provided the recipes for David Harrison's harassment, bombing, arson, and homicide schemes. But despite the absence of forensics evidence, a grand jury... Wait, he didn't have the poor man's James Bond, too? That's the anarchist cookbook, really. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I mean, you know, for... It's, wackos, illegal. It's... it's illegal to own, by the way. Which one? The, the anarchist, anarchist cookbook? cookbook. That's illegal to own. Oh, I thought you could get it. Uh, you, you can, can still no, you can you buy You can it. probably get it, but I'm relatively I, at least at one point it was it was. I know that it was it, if you bought it in a regular bookstore, you went on the watch list. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe that's <laughs> it. But I could have sworn that it was illegal to have that book, but anyway. Um. So a grand jury did indict uh, David Harrison for Ann's murder a year after her death. 
Uh, the circumstantial evidence was so robust that prosecutors felt they had a strong case, but David Harrison didn't, didn't think they did. So he turned down a plea bargain and waived his right to, uh, to a jury trial, which ended up being a mistake. Immediately after closing arguments in the 1990 trial, the judge announced that beyond a reasonable doubt, the circumstantial evidence overshadowed, overshadowed the lack of forensics, and he found the now 32-year-old David Harrison guilty of first-degree murder. During the sentencing, the judge declared that getting custody of the children wasn't Harrison's motive. He said, quote, the motive was something more sinister. Mr. Harrison is a manipulative person. He wanted to control Ann Jenkins' life, and that's really what this case is all about. Uh, it was reported that David Harrison smiled as the judge characterized his motivations. The judge sentenced him to another 20 years in prison after his existing 20-year term for the bomb, arson, and fraud charges. 20, and then he has to do 20 more. Yep. Wow. Uh, after that, Gary Jenkins was awarded custody of the two Harrison children. Uh, he used the lottery winnings to quit his job and raise all five children. A couple of years later, he remarried and resumed working, and he and his new wife also parented, uh, parented two of her children. Uh, Fifteen years after her son's conviction, David Harrison's mother, who was a tax preparer, pleaded, guilt, pleaded guilty for, for fraud. Uh, since the 70s, she'd helped clients invest their money in real estate trusts and certificates of deposit, but she'd actually deposited the client's funds into her own bank accounts and used them to buy property and support her family's living expenses, which David Harrison reaped a lot of those benefits. Yes, he did. Uh, she paid returns with funds from new investors, and eventually, as in all Ponzi operations, the pyramid collapsed. She was sentenced to a two-and-a-half-year prison term. Uh David Harrison appears to still remain in San Quentin. It was reported in 2016 that he was up with for parole. Uh, Deputy District Attorney Richard Sachs argued that he stayed in prison. He said, quote, not only do you have an unrepentant murderer who denies doing this despite overwhelming evidence, you have a dangerous man that was putting pipe bombs under people's cars and blowing up bolts. He's out of control. This guy is absolutely scary and needs to stay in prison for the rest of his life. The last I found on him is that he was denied parole again in 2001 and still sits there. Wow. Well, I mean, his sentence will be up in 2030. Right. <clears throat> so hmm. I think I think he probably does his entire time there. But that's yeah. the story of the murder of Ann Jenkins. Well, thank you for that. That was that was really fascinating. Yeah, that's I said that was sad, kind of a wild dude. one. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it was. It, it was very sad. I mean, you know, poor, poor lady. ladies, you know, trying to get 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 a different life and better yeah. herself and everything, and they win the lottery. And then she, she found a good deal. dude who who was yeah. who was right there helping her out, took in her kids too. It's fucked up. Yeah, that's fucked up. Fucked up. Anyway, so thanks for taking that journey with me. I really appreciate it. Uh, you're quite welcome. Thank you. Excuse me. That will take us to the end of another recording week. As always, you can find more information about us on nerderymurder.com. That's our hub. That's where you can find everything about us, including the links to what we talked about, uh, pictures of the subject matter we covered today, uh, as well as links to, uh, uh, the link to our YouTube page, which Zig takes care of with um, Thank you. such great care. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, we've got several scenes from those movies in in there, as well as some promo stuff as well. You guys should take, check that out. Some really good stuff in there. It's good stuff. I love checking that out. Um, you can also find the link to our merchandise store on our on our webpage. Uh, that's uh, if you wish to show off your nerdy and murdering fandom. Please do consider getting something from that. That along with our patrons, you have the link to our Patreon, uh, to our Patreon where you can uh, choose to donate to the show. There are costs that are associated with keeping us on the air and everything that from our merchandise and our Patreon does go towards our website and keeping our show on the air and keep bringing you the subject matters that you also love to listen to. We please do appreciate each and every one of you. Please and thank please you. Think. Sorry. I went early. Last but not least, please don't forget to leave a five-star review wherever you can. It really helps us and helps others find our content that may be looking for the subject matter we're talking about. So with that, I have been Zig with your nerdery. And I'm Jeffrey with your murdering. Give the music.